All right, welcome everyone to Warp News. Uh, we write fact-based optimistic news and other types of content on technology, science, and human progress. And who better to talk with about that uh, than um, Kevin Kelly, who is now out with his latest book, uh, Excellent Advice for Living. Uh, and I've prepared, uh, I've, I've of course read the book and I've, I've picked out a few um, uh, a, a few of your uh, advice uh, and um, some of them that I really like, some that I don't understand. <laughs> so uh, I, I thought we'll, we'll go through some of them um, uh, and you can explain them uh, to me. Uh, but first we have to reveal to, to, the, um, to, to everyone here that uh, Warp News and, and, and you have a, a little bit of a history. Um, you, a, a couple of years ago now, uh, almost, you wrote uh, The Case for Optimism, uh, for warp news and uh, and also also that became a, a TED talk with over over two million views. Uh, is that your most successful TED talk? You have several successful ones, but I honestly don't know. <laughs> I haven't looked, <laughs> so okay. it might be. But I've been giving TED talks. I think I've given five or six of them, and they've been around a long time. Of course, the longer the older ones have more of a chance to be seen. So so I don't know, but um, it's very. I'm I'm very impressed. <laughs> yeah, 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 me too. <laughs> and and it's and it's our most read article ever. Um, mm -hmm. So we haven't been long uh, around that long, but but it's our yeah, most yeah. read article by by far. So and it and it's really good. So and that's actually where I want to want to start uh, because that that essay you wrote for us is based on on uh, this advice, and it's also on my T-shirt here. Right. Um, and I, I had to cut the advice a little bit here because there was a 200 character <laughs> limit here. So it says, over the long term, the future is decided by optimists. To be an optimist, you don't have to ignore the multitude of problems we create. You just have to imagine how much our ability to solve problems uh, improves. Please explain this. What, why, why, do you, what, what do you see? Why is the future created or decided by optimists? Well, um, in, in retrospect... Um, if we look at all the things that surround us now, especially all the cool, vital, be the best things that we make from, you know, from a phone, a smartphone to uh, electric cars, you know, to vaccines, MRA vaccines, it just goes down the list. They were all created by someone in the past who imagined these impossible things at the time. And more importantly, um, believed that they could be made, that they could be that these impossible things could be real. And um, so, so our our present is actually has been created by the optimists of the past, who were um, willing and capable of imagining a, a, a something good, and then um, believing enough to to carry through and making it happen. And that means that today. There are people who will be imagining things that seem to be impossible or unlikely, improbable, hard to do, who believe that they can be done, they ha who have the optimism to believe that, that, that um, while they don't exist today, they will exist tomorrow and they'll be better for us. And they're the ones who are going to make it happen. And in fact, if we look at it that way, then the only ones who are making the future the future world that we will have are basically the optimists. So, so, um, so these, these incredibly complicated things that we want in the future cannot happen accidentally or inadvertently. You can't kind of arrive at doing these things without some kind of a pre-visioning, some kind of imagining them first. And seeing, making your way there, you can't just sort of accidentally arrive at these things. And so it becomes ever more important that we have more people trying to imagine a future that they want. I, I um, again, to reiterate my little bit, this doesn't negate the reality of the problems or the severity of the problems. Nor does it negate the fact that we need people who are focused on the problems. But we have plenty of those. Yeah. I think we just don't have enough of the people who are focusing on the future, the, the, the solutions. They're much harder to see. The, the, the problem about 
or the the issue with problems is that they're very easy to see. It's, it's entropy. It's the easy path. The easy path is that most things will fail. Most stuff is junk. Most things won't work. Most things are problems. That's the easy thing because that's entropy. The more difficult thing is is doing these exotropic, really complicated things that are improbable. And therefore, they require a lot more work to even imagine. They're more expensive to imagine, you could say. And so um, fewer people do them because it's a lot harder work. And um, all I'm suggesting is we need more of that. Um, and how do we get more more optimists or more people that are more more optimistic? How do how do we create the optimist? So I think optimism, it, while there's certainly a temperamental aspect to it, is actually a skill that you can acquire, that you can come become better at, that you can deliberately choose to do. And I think for me, I found that the best trick, the best um, what's the word I want, the the best strategy is to um, take a longer view. The longer you view ha that you have of both the past and into the future, the easier it is to be an optimist. The longer view enables you to understand that you can accumulate good stuff, even with a very small difference, because it's compounded over time. And that means that over the long term, you're able to overcome even fairly severe setbacks and, you know, temporary diseases and all these other things um, that are part of, of life. They, they are, are actually overcome by compounding benefits over time if you take the long view. So the longer your view, I think the easier it is to be an optimist. Yeah. And I, um, Uh, our our mission is is to make the future come sooner, and and we think we can achieve that by um, uh, helping to change the mindset of, of of humanity, or at least many many humans, so they become uh, more optimistic. And I, uh, because I'm I'm optimistic, um, and and uh, that we can achieve that, even though it's very very hard. Um, I. I feel you get a lot of energy from that because of course you run into whatever new thing you're trying to create or change you're trying to make. Uh, you run into problems and obstacles and, and, and all that. And you have to find the energy and, and sort of seeing that, envisioning that positive future gives me, gives me a lot of energy to, co to, to, to continue, uh, which is also part of, 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 of the optimism. Right. So um, uh, another um, uh, uh, and, and, tie into that i heard when i've listened to a few of the other interviews you've done uh, around your your new book um uh, which is which is your your next problem uh, uh so it's not not problem project your mm. next project uh, so so tell us about about that it sounds sounded very interesting so my next project is what i call protopia subtitle this the hundred year desirable future so i am trying to take my own advice and to imagine a, a world on this planet uh, that's full of all these technological inventions like ubiquitous AI of various species and levels of cheap working genetic engineering of everything in our, li in our lives, including wild species um and you know kind of constant monitoring of ourselves to put ourselves into these metaverses and and then to imagine all this being a place that i want to live in being it not a scary dystopian hell but a place that we can't wait to get to and um it's hard it's hard to imagine how all these things play out in a very positive way, but that's my scenario. That's my assignment is to make this as a scenario. It's what we call a normative scenario, meaning it's not a prediction. I'm not saying this is what's going to happen. I'm saying this is what I would like to happen and to complete the project, to make it plausible. I am also um, trying to put it into 10 year increments so that, all the in-between steps that would happen 
um, would be clear um, because I think that's one of the mistakes of, of a lot of scenarios or even we'll call it science fiction stories is that they have, they have a world that doesn't usually make much sense because the intermediate steps right. mm-hmm. are not present. It's like bicycles, even hundred years are not going to go away. All right, there are going to be bicycles in a hundred years, and you know I don't see any futures where people are still riding bicycles, let alone electric bicycles. So, so it, it's it's um, kind of going through the a ten year increments, the scenario is ten year increments. So it has a, actually has a history. Um, is the larger thing to help me keep it um, plausible and honest. So, so that's the project, and. Um, uh, We'll see whether it um, a is possible, and two whether it's useful. Um, I would like it to be possible and useful, and and the use, by the way, um, besides my own interest. And so this is like a lot. Most of my projects is something I do first for myself. I am the audience, and secondly, I'm hoping that um, if it does work, that it would be useful for science fiction authors to write oh stories goodness. in this world. Again, this is not a prediction, but to actually make a world that we could have science fiction stories written in it that would not be dystopian, but would be um, protopian. And that this would be kind of like a background thing where it's the world is really not the character. It's just a world that's futuristic, that's positive, that people could write their the thrillers or science fiction thrillers or their dramas inside. So there would be a complete world that would be ready for them to write stories in. Yeah, that's, that's really smart. I, I thought of all the others, uh, not all of them, but some of the other aspects that's good, but, but that's a really good one. I guess it, I guess science fiction, of course, it's easier to put a, some drama in a, uh, in, in a, and in dystopian future, uh, much better to put the drama in a dystopian because then you have, you have the native conflict and the horror, and and right. that's the reason why we don't have very many because the alternative is sort of boring. Yeah, and also there's no no you know there's Star Trek maybe and and uh, maybe a few others, but there's not much to go on if you want to build like you say if you want to build right. your world you have to do all the thinking all the thinking right, you're right, doing right, now right, right, and, right. and that's yeah so yeah, that's a and, smart. And, by the way, Star Trek is not on our planet, so it doesn't right. do yeah. that. Exactly. And it's a long, long jump <laughs> into yeah, the future. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. But it, this is your um, your vision. It's not a crowdsourced right. project. It's it's your thoughts, uh, you know. But it feels like a natural, if it's successful, it feels like a natural continuation, maybe, that people add on, you know, whatever their visions of the future. Absolutely. It, was, it would be really primed to once we kind of know what it is. And the problem initially is, is that I don't know what it is. I don't know what format is it. Does it, is it like a, is it like a, a book, which I don't think it is. Is it like a, a world? Is it like a game? Is it just a data? Is it a database? I don't know. And right. so, and so once we kind of know what it is, then we can kind of make it crowdsource. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Crowdsource is too early. Right, now. right. Okay. All right. Um, here's another piece of advice from your uh, book. The hard part in predicting the future is to forget everything you expect it to be. Uh, this mm. one I didn't really understand. It was one of those. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, in, in, in having done many, many scenario workshops with a GBN, which was a boutique future consulting company, that kind of invented and perfected the scenario process for helping corporate businesses, institutions try to think about the future. In doing these exercises with people, it was very clear that the biggest hurdle for folks was forgetting what they thought the future ought to be because the thing about the future is not gonna be reasonable it's not going to be the expected. So letting go of the expected was the most difficult part. Um, How do you do that? How do you? 
it's it's um we do we used to do a little exercise called the unthinkables where you start with seemingly unthinkable things you take something that just says that that's never going to happen and you say well what happened if it did happen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how would we get there right and that kind of process uh of loosening up because then you as you're going through it you realize well actually it's not as unthinkable as i thought it was originally and um so you kind of want you know these sort of heretical thoughts that's okay like the u.s could break up right what if the u.s breaks mm -hmm. up into different success you know texas and the west coast and okay well that's sort of unthinkable is that how likely is it well I, it seems unlikely but it's possible and over the long term, you know, and so we'll, let, let's go through that. Let's see mm -hmm. um, what that looks like and what would that mean and what would the early signs be and all that kind of stuff. And so you begin to to loosen up. And you, so, and so that originally it was like an unthinkable idea. But, okay, the more you look at it, the more you say, <laughs> for example, there have been no U.S. president no York, no U.S. president has ever died under the same flag that they were born un, under. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, basically, the borders of the U.S. have been mm. changing the mm. entire time of our mm. very short life. So, uh, so anyway, that's just an example. Yeah. Of, okay. Of this idea okay. Of so you force to, yourself to think something, and then your mind opens up a bit. Uh, right. Because because where we're going. I mean, right now what we have in the world today would not have been believable right 30 years ago right right i mean it's just like that would not you would have been thrown out of the class as as making up something that was too mm. hard to believe mm. right okay all right then i understand um let's see uh next one here Another device. Uh, this is the best time ever to make something. None of the greatest, coolest creations 20 years from now have been invented yet. You are not late. This is one of your other essays, a really famous right. uh, famous one. Um, um, but but explain it. Why, why is this the best time to create? Why wasn't well, there, it in 1997, for example? Yeah. So, so, so it's the best time from the perspective of history because we've never had as many tools available for individuals anywhere in the planet, no matter what your station in life is, than, than now. There's never been cheaper money available ever. There's never been as big a market for your creations than ever before in history. So we can just go through the list of reasons why um, the equipment that you would need to do something or make something happen has never been as good as it has been in the past as today. And then it's also the best time ever in terms of the future because um, right now, let's say, just take an example, AI, there are no AI experts compared to what they'll be in 30 years. Looking back 30 years, people say, well, you didn't even have AI. There was no AI experts. Um, there are no virtual reality <clears throat> creation experts. There's no um, genetic engineering of the human journal -like clone, human clone experts. Okay, so so um, so compared to the future, this is a time when there's very little competition for all these new inventions because they don't exist. So therefore there's an opportunity for you to be the expert um, if you want to be. And so, um, so even in terms of the timeline of history, this is the best time ever compared for the past and to the future to start something. Right. And speaking of those tools, that we have available now um, uh, over the last 12 months or so, we've gotten uh, some, some new, very impressive tools, ChatGPT and um, uh, 
um, Mid Journey and, and the others to create images. I see you you're doing daily AI art. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, but so what? Is, how, how do you use these tools and 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 what are your sort of what what is your take on 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 them? At least you know could be long long term, but but maybe especially short term. Um, well, um, the tools are rapidly uh, evolving by by the day. Just just two days ago, was it? Uh, Photoshop announced um, a built-in variety of the image generators into Photoshop itself, just Photoshop, and something called generative fill. And they've had context-aware fill, which was a kind of a very crude version for years, but this is using AI to be able to extend pictures, photographs, um, make them you know, extend the borders or fill in areas or change things within the the picture in a very, very, I would call it accurate, fairly accurate way of matching that and filling it in, 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 you know, in a way that humans could do with hours and hours and hours of expertise work. So, so they're not necessarily, and Photoshop has been, used to do these things in the past manually. So it's not doing anything new. It's just that it's doing it fast and without the skill of, of, of a person. So someone like me who has very little retouching skills with Photoshop, I, I'm, I can do it. And it's just, it's just amazing. And I was repairing some images, repairing some images, mm -hmm. I call it repairing um, some images that had that, 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 um, I have for years been unhappy with, and now I can kind of fix them um, to my like. And that's um, that's just one easy, simple way. Of course, we can imagine it's, it's like it's like Photoshop on steroids. So all the things that Photoshop is going to be used for now, the people who are professionals doing it will have even more tools. It'll be even faster. They'll do more amazing things, and um, it'll you know. It's already kind of present in Hollywood and movies. That's the, I've been saying for a long time, the next step is really not doing 2D pictures because that's easy. As I said, humans can do it. But where it really gets powerful is when these same tools are moved into video, yeah. making video, making worlds where it's, where, where it really is beyond an individual to be able to do these. Now individuals can do these, do these meaning make a feature film. Okay, or, or 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 you know, or or, or a small team. So that's that's where the superpower really is. Yeah, that's going to be amazing. You know, yeah, exactly. When you write a prompt and you get a feature length movie out of that, it's uh, right. But, yeah. And, and ju just to be clear, that will never happen. Meaning, you write yes, you will write a prompt and you get a feature length film, but it'll be unwatchable. Yeah, it, it's like photography. The the, the painters in the eighteen hundreds. We're saying, well, this photography, this is not art, uh, and it's going to ruin painting because you just press the button. And, <laughs> and what we know about photography is that it's not just pressing the button. Exactly. Yeah, anybody can press the button, and you'll get an image, but it won't be very good. And the same thing with the AI uh, video um, generating. Yeah, you'll press the click it, and you'll get something, but it won't be any good to actually get something it may take a year of mm -hmm. work for an mm -hmm. individual, but nonetheless, that's okay. It's like spending a year writing a novel. It's, it's doable, but it's incredible amount of work. And they'll be clicking that button a million times. Yeah, no, exactly. And I'm, I'm writing a book right now uh, using chat GPT. And of course I could have write, written that in three hours or something, uh, but it would be unreadable uh, or it would be something, but it, no right. one would read it, not even my mother. Right. Uh, but so I have to spend time on it. But, but when I spend time on it, when I increase my skills in, in prompting it, um, then, you know, the outcome both in ideas, but, you know, feedback on what I write and, you know, so, so, so this is the same thing, but just the possibility of, being skilled at that and creating video or yeah. movies or whatever uh, opens up so much. Uh, so, so if we look at the way you're using it and the way I'm using it, the, the, the framing that we want to take away from this is, is that um, these AIs in plural, there's 
huge variety of them. They're already different. You know, Midjourney is different from Dolly, which is different from PseudoWrite, which is different from ChatGPT. Um, all these different AIs in plural. Um, the framing that we want to have is our relationship is with is with uh, co-pilot, interns, assistants, team members, colleagues. There, it's a cooperative, collaborative yep. relationship, and it's not not a replacement. It's not a replacement. It's a relation. It's a collaboration, and so um, so that's how we're going to be using them. And there'll be um, a little bit more than a tool in that sense of. They're going to have their own personalities, their own quirks. They'll be far more interactive and sentient than mm -hmm. uh, a tool. But they're, the, you know, we're using them as tools. But they're, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a work animal. It's kind of like having a horse move your 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 goods. It's a tool. You're using it as a tool, but it's it's a living being that has its own. Its own dynamics, and so these are going to be working with them in that sense of yeah, we're we're using them as tools, but in fact they they're sentience that responds to us, and so the relationship is much closer to an intern or an assistant, and maybe when they get even better, maybe a teammate or a duet. Mm. Speaking of AI, the, the because the fast progress in in the last um, few months here has really mm -hmm. sparked the debate about uh, about um, the the dangers of AI, especially, mm -hmm. especially human extinction. So some people want to pause um, something uh, <laughs> around AI. So what is your uh, what is your stance on 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 the, the current debate and 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 how should we think about AI alignment um, in 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 the future if if we should? So there's there's different levels of the alignment. I mean, the thing about these models is they've been trained on the average human work. I mean, the the best of human content and the worst of it, and so it kind of averages out to. Um, there's a machine to kind of predict what the average human might do next. And um, the average human is slightly racist and sexist and ageist and all these other things and maybe mean. So we want them to be better than us. And so this idea of um, aligning their values is, is legitimate. That, that, that aspect of trying to, um, Make them better than than we are on average, I think is is um, is a worthy is a worthy thing to work on. There's the existential risk element, which says that um, it, it goes beyond the concern goes beyond just um, making them aligned with their values, but but um, there's a safety issue where they're where they're going to take over in some ways or or in some ways. Um, Become so out of, become powerful and out of control that that it hurts us, and I think that is a greater than zero probability, but so low that we don't need the shouldn't inform our policy very much. So, they recent signature just yesterday compares it to a pandemic or climate change. Um, I think it's closer to an asteroid impact. Okay, an asteroid impact would be devastating, but there's a very, very little chance that it actually happens. However, we because it's, because it would be disastrous, we really should have people in a program trying to you know spot them and deflect them and figure out what to do. And there is there's a there's a group of people called um, um, uh, B twelve sixteen, and um, it is. Uh, Serious scientists, astronomers, other people who are concerned about the the consequences of an asteroid impact and are doing everything they can to prevent that from happening on Earth. Okay, well, I, I think we have something similar to, but but here's here's the thing about that. But we aren't making policy decisions based on the fact that we might have an asteroid impact. Right. We aren't deciding that we're going to make asteroid-proof buildings. Right. Okay. We're not regulating. We're not regulating it. Right. Right. And so <laughs> I, I would say the same thing with 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 this existential threat of AI. Yes, it's a more than a zero probability that it will happen. 
there should be some people working it, but we shouldn't be making policies and regulating based on the on that low probability of it, because it is a very low probability in my estimation. And the and the reason why we differ from some of the you know uh, people from Milan to to Eliza Yudkowsky is that um, they tend to overestimate, um, overrate. In the role of intelligence in the world of, of making things happen. So, mm -hmm. so, so, um, th there, there are guys who like to think and they think that thinking is the most important thing. Yeah. And right. in order to make things happen in the world, intelligence is required, but it's not the major thing necessarily. It's, yeah. it's not the smartest people who are making the things happen in the world. And it's not the smartest people in the room necessarily who are making things go forward. Yep. Um, and, you know, and so um, intelligence alone is insufficient to make change in the world. You need to have persistence. You need to have empathy. You need to have ingenuity and, and resourcefulness and all kinds of other things yep. for, for that to happen. And that's, so when they talk about AI, so AI in a black box may be very, really super smart, but doesn't mean they can actually make things happen in the world or affect things yep. that so so anyway so so I, I i i differ from their evaluation of the role of intelligence it's something we want but alone it's insufficient to make things happen in the world yeah because they they often make a very big jump from uh, it's reaches the intelligence of 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 a human and 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 increases above that but first you have to increase the intelligence above because a, one human is not very smart uh, you know you and i can't make all the stuff right, in the right. world you know it's humanity that is smart and and thousands of years of 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 um, you, you know um sure of knowledge so so that's the first step but then also it's like it's it's a they make a jump from from that until yeah and then it controls the world okay but there's a lot of dictatorships around the world how how will you turn them into democracies um you won't do that like that. It's not, and the dictator is not the smartest. They're the toughest, right, right. you know, uh, most right. controlling people, you know. So there's many, many steps, um, you know, for an for an AI, <laughs> you know. Right, um, and, and, and their answer always is, it was so smart that it'll figure it out. Yeah. And it wants to. And, I'm, and all I can say is that you put Einstein and a tiger in a cage and see <laughs> see if the smartest one wins. It, it, smartness is not sufficient and, and here's the other thing. The other thing is that um, what we know from nature is that the will to survive always trumps the will of predation. So most predators fail in killing the, the prey. It's, you know, right. it's nine times mm -hmm. out of 10, they don't work because the will to survive is much yeah. greater. And so, you have nine, you have eight billion, nine billion people. The will to survive is incredibly stronger than the will to eliminate them. And mm -hmm. so, um, where does that? So that will is is independent again of of intelligence. You can be super smart, but not have the will. Where and so and so um, again, just being really really smart doesn't mean that you can trump and overcome the will to survive of 8 billion people. Right. Okay, uh, next advice to be remarkable, read books. Not only your books, I guess, but books in, in general. Even though I've become more, I think I'm more remarkable by reading your books, especially The, the Inevitable. Uh, it's really good. Mm -hmm. And this one, of course. But but explain this. Um, why, are, why are books so important? Yeah. Um... Of course, when I say a book, uh, I, I, I want to be clear that I'm talking about the the, um, the logical, conceptual thing of a long argument, sustained long argument or narrative, which is contained in the book, whether it's on paper or in you know digital bits in the sky, right? It's in your Kindle or on the web. So um, I think um, what I should have said, and I've said elsewhere, is to be remarkable, read the books that nobody else is reading, um, which would be even better. But um, let, just, just if you can read any books these days, 
um, there is something about the um, the transmission of information from one mind to another mind that we haven't yet been able to do any other way. Um, I am a huge, huge fan of YouTube. I, I think YouTube is way underrated in terms of its impact on the culture. I think this conveyance and learning is stellar and really great for many things. And in many cases, better than a book. But, and I think the future will be some marriage of bookness plus video, uh, TV that you read, movies or books that you watch so 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 i think but but again going back to now um we haven't yet eclipsed the power of of a words on a page to transmit complicated sophisticated knowledge and information and um, so 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 um if you're not reading, you're kind of missing out on ways to improve yourself. And um, the remarkable part of it is that um, you can read so widely. You, you, you can read the ancients. You can you you, you, you can um, become educated by the past in a way that even YouTube hasn't quite caught up into doing. And that will make you remarkable because most people are not doing that. I mean, kind of, kind of a weird way. The reading, the reason why reading books will make you remarkable is because so few people are reading books. I hate right. to say that. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's, sort of, uh, uh, that's sort of where it's at. So if you were to give a, a few book tips, your, your favorite mm. books or, or books books that will make people more remarkable if they read them oh my gosh you know it's funny because if you're in the habit of rereading books it's kind of scary sometimes because there's lots of books that really changed my life and i've gone back to read them and it's like they don't work as well they, oh. they don't hold up <laughs> right <laughs> right so or in other cases they might improve but um so 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 all I'm to say is i think there are seasons in people's lives and and mm. there, there, i know there are books that that's my friends have just swore changed their lives and i read them and they and i bounce off of it and vice versa things that it was like my gosh this is like you need to read this and they're kind of yeah they're uh, that's all right so so um And that's why you want to read widely because you can't really tell what it is that you actually need to hear right now to, that will unleash something in you that you didn't know or find something you didn't know you're looking for. And so, um, you know, the kinds, so I, you know, I, I, I wrote about somewhere, I uh, posted the, you know, the four or five books that I felt changed my life, the course of my life and including in that was the whole earth catalog which I eventually wound up working for and running. It was so influential um, to the Bible, which um, I think is both the most underrated and the most overrated book at the same time. It doesn't say what you think it says, no matter what you think it says. And so read it. It's so instrumental in our culture. You really owe it yourself to read it once all the way through. And, um, You know, it could go on from there. So there's there are there are <laughs> books that that um, and science fiction stories that, in retrospect, I wouldn't even recommend, but were hugely influential on me as a kid at the time. Um, so uh, you know, if I had a reading list of like current fiction today or current nonfiction. Um, Uh, I, I really liked Humankind. Mm. Humankind. I think it was a Swedish author. I don't remember. Uh, he's uh, he's Dutch. Uh, Rut okay, uh, yeah, Dutch. Rutger. Uh, yeah, it's Greek, Dutch. Dutch. All right. Mm. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, four. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's so. It's so uh, sounds very similar. Yeah. Uh, Rutger <laughs> is also a Swedish name. So yeah. <laughs> um, which is making the argument that, um, which I think people need to hear, 
um, which is that the default uh, human response is not selfishness, but selflessness, that, that, that we are at our core, a collaborative, social, um, helpful animal to each other. And that's, that's the mark of what makes us humans is that unlike most animals, we've sort of transcended slightly some of the animal instinct or self-preservation only and, and work more with, with groups, more socially to try to have the group survive. And that altruism is native to humans and not as we've been told that, you know, given everything else, people will only be selfish, particularly in the crisis. And so he shows pretty good evidence why that's wrong and why we should shift our stance, which is in perfect alignment with my observations about the world, um, which is that you can trust strangers and that most yep. people for most times will do good. And um, if you bank on that, if you work on that and you treat them as if they're going to treat you, you'll be rewarded un, you know, uh, unfairly in some, in some ways. Yeah. And several of your advice in, in, in your book now is along those lines right. uh, that you can you know, actually trust people. Um, uh, and, and yes, I, I really love humankind uh, and, and the title is great, humankind. Right. Um, right. And uh, he has a story in there of Lord of the Flies uh, and yes. Lord of the Flies is so it's, it's fiction, but it's, 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 it's treated like it's nonfiction. Yeah. Um, it feels like it's happened for real. And, but he found a real, a yep. real Lord of the flies and it, it didn't turn into that nasty. It, it's a great story. So everyone should, should read it. I shouldn't tell it, but it, it's, it's the opposite of Lord of the flies. And it's a very beautiful story of, of, of the real Lord of the flies. So and he's and there's many... actually several documentaries um, on YouTube where you can actually see the kids. Oh, um, okay. Mm -hmm. And go back and visit them and hear their, their version of it. Oh, okay. um, because they went back and they kind of recreated some of the scenes on that very island with the same kids. And so, um, uh, yeah, it's um, th that's a perfect example of, of, of um, what I mean by the, of changing my mind in, I mean, not changing my mind, but changing my, what's the word I want? I think I have changed my mind over time, not because of the book, but the book mm -hmm. confirms the change of mind that I had. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, next advice. You mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier. For maximum results, focus on your biggest opportunities, not your biggest problems. That's usually uh, the way uh, every every advice is that, you know, look at the biggest problems in the world. Um, you know, those are the biggest opportunities. And, mm -hmm. and sure, uh, that, that is, of course, right. But here you want, um, you, you think we should focus on the biggest opportunities instead. Why, 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 why that and not the problems? Um, because um, I think problems are, what's the word I want? They're like the spark that might, ignite the fire but the fuel has to be the opportunities so you may a great one of the greatest which i didn't put into the book which i should have but one of the greatest pieces of advice for a, for startups and entrepreneurs was from paul hawkin which was um a, a really great place to start is is where you're where you are a dissatisfied customer already so starting with your kind of dissatisfaction um you know waiting in line at the post office. Okay. So you do stamps.com or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's this idea where it's a problem, but that's just the spark. But the real, the real fuel comes from it. Well, here's an opportunity. Here's, you know, here's, here's something where there's nobody's done anything. And so you, 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 you turn it into, and you, 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 you are running on the fuel of the opportunity, even though that initial spark might've been a problem rather than kind of like just focusing on um, on um, what's the word I want. Um, it's sort of like, it's like, it's like getting too focused on your competitors, which is a common. So, so competitors are a problem. If you're running right. a business, you have a competitor, 
you're focusing on the fact that they're taking your customers or that they're occupying that on the shelf there, whatever. And those are problems. But if you're focused on your opportunities, it's like, well, maybe we go, we don't, we're not even in the grocery store. Maybe we're at the, in a warehouse somewhere, whatever you, it's like, where are there bigger opportunities? And we're not thinking about competitors at all. We're only thinking about what's new and what we can do. Um, and so, um, the, the idea of, of, here's maybe what I'd say too. The thing about problems is that they are limited by definition. They're limiting. Right. And the yeah. thing about opportunities is that they're unlimited. So, so it's that open-ended aspect of the problems. I mean, they have no limits. There is no boundary in which you can go, which gives you a far more room to maneuver and far more upside. Whereas by definition, the problems are limited and that's sort of, that's their, often their problems that they are, is that they are limiting. And so it's not that you can't deal with them or use them, but you want to focus, which is all I'm saying, is you want to focus on the open-ended side of the equation because that will often give you solutions for the problems. Right. Okay, I have a, <clears throat> a last question. And uh, uh, in that, I want you to give me uh, advice that is not in your, your book. So uh, I run um, Warp News. And what we've been successful in is that we've, you know, we have... Uh, when people find us, uh, uh, we have good conversion to our free newsletter and from that good conversion mm -hmm. to our paid newsletter. But we've been growing too slowly and there are many uh, uh, different reasons why and, and you don't know the details of, sure. of Warp News, um, of course. But sort of in in general and, and, and this it's advice to me. Um, I one of the one of the reflections I've made over the last um, uh, year or so is that I should ask, I should ask people for more advice. I've been too bad at asking people for advice. So I've started doing that, and and it's really amazing. I can re that's an advice for me. Start asking people for <laughs> advice. Uh, so now I'm going to ask you for advice. You know how how should we uh, go about growing uh, warp news faster? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the optimistic news, and that could be turning to more general questions about news media. How do we how do we make news media? Uh, uh, more balanced, uh, positive, negative, uh, sort of how do we grow the, the optimistic, the positive news, and especially uh, warp news? That's a really big question. Um, I always start, and I think other people have said this, I always start with the why, with, with, with what, why you want to do this, what the end result would look like, what success what the success state is and work back from that because mm -hmm. that will tell you me so so it's like okay let's say warp news is a raging success over the next 10 years what would that mean what would that look like at the end of 10 years so what's what's your right. answer to that what does it look like um uh, we we would then be um uh, a fairly large global uh, news company and and the importance of it being large is that then it would have uh, of course reached many people so helped have both helped change their mind and 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 sort of enforce their their optimism but also then um, it would be a successful business that other news media could see uh, that oh okay it's not just negative clickbait that works there's there's an audience for something else here and also there's some real journalism in here because that's uh, that's what I hear from other from other you know, other news media journalists is like um, what you're doing is not real journalism uh, we're doing you know we're scrutinizing uh, the you know big companies or politicians and, and all that. But they only do that from one perspective. It's my answer. You only you only mm -hmm. look at what oh that sounds too good to be true. You never look at oh that sounds too bad to be true. Um, uh -huh. So so that kind of success I think would help um, bring about a change in, in other news media and, and of course not just the the current ones but you know other sort of our competitors then uh, right. you know, would, would, would so so um, 
you, you mentioned uh, success in terms of say internally with your business, but I, I'm talking more about externally. How would, um, how, how what would the, be the impact? And um, one of the things too that you've have did mention in your little summary was the word read. So is this, would you continue to focus on the, the words part of it is um, because I think, I think, you know, going back to what we we're saying earlier, I think the center of the culture has moved away from books. We're no longer people, of the books were people of the screen and um it may not be that people will continue to, you know, want to read um, their news. It may be that it is something more that you watch. Um, and so that's, so, so, um, so there's that one thing in terms of your description of what you imagine it mm -hmm. being successful. Um, and how often, or what's the frequency or what, um, w again, you're raging, you're wildly successful. What, what, what do you see this? Does it become news? You, do you see that people are going to be in the successful version, the big version of it? Are people reading or getting news from you every day? Is this hourly? Is this daily? Is this weekly? What, how, like, are you going to, do you imagine again the successful state that you would be mm -hmm. seeing like daily news in this way? You have a special filter that there will be processing daily news, or is it something? Is it something else? No, definitely daily. And I said red, uh, red because that's what we do today, and that's what we know. But you're definitely right. We need to in in a this successful scenario, we need to expand into sort of everything. And what out what out is in in ten years? Right. Yeah, we, we can know some of it, but not all of it. But but yes, but yes, definitely daily. Um, both news and and I'm thinking these kind of since we're Warp Institute, the, the organization behind Warp News is, is a community uh, of of you know, optimistic, forward-looking people. Right, right. Um, I think we're going to be able to find more and more stories in there from from them. Um, they create new, new whatever projects, uh, companies, and all that, and we sure, can tell sure. those stories over over a long term. Uh, that will create short-term news, but also long-term stories that other can be both learn from and be inspired from. So, sort of a positive spiral of of content right, right, and, right. and real things that have you know done. Right. Uh, you know. right. So, you know, I mean, Wired was, was, was very much, you know, cast in the same kind of, of mold of wanting to be uh, optimistic and a role in the world. And, and, and I, I would say, and I have to go in a few minutes, but I would say that um, one of the geniuses that Louis Rossetto brought to it, because I was kind of running something similar maybe not as decidedly optimistic uh, at whole earth, but it was certainly conceptual news was, was, was he said uh, his genius was like um, wrapping it around people and their dreams. So my stuff was pretty conceptual and it had a, it had a very avid um, but small readership, small meaning we had 40,000 people at the, at the most. Um, but Lewis wanted to make it said, well, these ideas need to be wrapped around people or people wrapped around the ideas. You have people on the cover. You talk about the people who are making these things, what their dreams are and what they're, what they want. And that was the difference that moved it into a different level entirely of, of much larger numbers and a much bigger audience was because of that people component. So that would be maybe the only thing I would say is you might consider is um, doing what Wire did, which is wrap it around people and their dreams. Hmm. That's very good. Very good advice. Um, and, and, um, uh, and, and thank you so much for, for that. Sure. And, and thank you for taking the advice um, to, to talk to me and, and uh, our, our audience. And, uh, 
And uh, to everyone uh, listening or, or reading this uh, later, uh, please check out Kevin Kelly's uh, latest book. Uh, there it is. Advice. There it is. Uh, Excellent advice for living. Wisdom I wish you known earlier. There's 450 little bits of the three or like the three or four that we mentioned. There's 450 more of them. Lots of. <laughs> it's a very easy read. You can it's read an it easy read, and, but but it, exactly, it's an easy read. But you you can stop and think. Um, on, on all of the advice yeah. and, and uh, they're, they're quite different also. So, um, so thank you very much thank for, you. for that, um, um, Kevin. Uh, and I'm really looking forward also to your, uh, your new uh, project to see the outcome yeah. uh, of that. So um, talk to you again uh, soon, I hope. Uh, thank yes, you very much. Best of success with your publication. I'm really glad it's there and I'm wishing you great fortune with it. Thank you very much.